Our final speaker tonight is perfectly positioned to connect his experiences with modern day business. Bertie Carr is an ex-Royal Marine captain with several tours of Afghanistan and Iraq under his belt. More recently, since leaving the military, Bertie has climbed the ranks within the investment banking industry and he's now Vice President at Deutsche Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bertie Carr. That's very well. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for that kind introduction. And uh, Martin and all the other speakers for your um, interesting talks. Some really good ideas there and, and amazing insights. Martin asked me to come and share a few of my experiences from uh, my time in the Marines and thereby hopefully maybe uh, shed some light on, on leadership styles and some insights into leadership. So come along with me, bear with me, and uh, hopefully you can take something away from it. Nine years ago, I found myself in a long file of Royal Marines. We were patrolling through the night to go out and attack an enemy mortar position at first light. We were in southern Afghanistan. I was the troop commander. I had 30 commandos in my troop. My, I was aged 23, and my men were aged between 18 and 32. I was nervous. I'm not ashamed to say that I was scared, very scared. The fighting was going to be up close and fierce. So I was nervous and scared for my own physical safety, but also because I was in charge. We were in perhaps the most dangerous situation we could be in, and the buck stopped with me. I had 30 people looking at me for direction and guidance, and there is no lonelier place than command on combat operations. I realized then, in more so than in an entire childhood of reading war stories, how important leadership is and how it needs to be done well for any endeavor to succeed. I felt it was my duty to be as good a leader as possible. I felt I owed it to my guys, to my lads, to be that leader. And I felt daunted by that challenge. I had an old fashioned sense of leadership. I was the fourth Captain Carr in an unbroken chain of service that spanned back for over a century. My father was in the Navy for 37 years. He commanded several ships and finished as a rear admiral. His father was also in the Navy and spent three and a half years in a Japanese prison of war in the Far East when his ship was sunk. Their example sat heavily in my mind when I embarked on my own career, and never more so than that morning when I was leading my men into battle for the very first time. So perhaps a few words on what I mean by leadership. There are many theories, many ideas. <clears throat> Mine's probably not uh, a new theory or a new idea, but it certainly caps encapsulates for me what I mean by the term. It'll resonate very strongly with what's already been said this evening. For me, leadership is a form of behavior driven by your values and beliefs that inspires others to perform well and work hard. I'll say it again. Leadership is value-driven behavior that inspires others to perform. By so doing, it encourages them to work hard, perform well, and it improves your chances of success. If everyone is raising their game inspired by someone else who is driven by their beliefs, if everyone's raising their game and improving their performance, then your chances of success in attaining your goals, meeting your targets, or succeeding in your mission, obviously, are dramatically increased. So mine is a utilitarian theory of leadership. It serves a purpose. I'd like to draw out a couple of details about this theory before I try to illustrate it with a few anecdotes. <clears throat> Note the use of the word inspiration. We've heard the word used a number of times this evening. A good leader inspires his people to perform well. It's not sufficient to pay them or to force them or to reason with them. You're not looking for a rational response from your people. That's not sufficient. You look to connect with them on an emotional level. And what do we have an emotional response to? When do we react in an emotional way? Well, it's when we see someone who is driven by their values and beliefs. When we see someone who's not driven by greed or by self-interest or by some other flight of fancy, of ambition, 
but by someone who honestly believes what he, is, he or she is doing is right and is driven by that belief. It's an extremely attractive quality that people are drawn to. They'll be inspired by it and they will raise their game. Most people know what they do when they go to work. Some people are able to explain how they do it. Leaders are able to explain why they do what they do. Again, they believe in what they're doing. They understand the need for what they're doing. Other people can see that and they follow them. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of mission statements. As leaders of thriving businesses, no doubt you all have snappy mission statements to deliver your brand and explain uh, what you do to your clients. And that's only right, but I'm sure it will come as no surprise that you stole that directly from the military. We were the ones who had mission statements. We were the ones who had missions. Business didn't. But uh, nonetheless, for everything we did in the military, we would have a mission statement. Whether it was an objective, some task, whatever mission it was, to capture exactly what we were trying to achieve, we would articulate it with a mission statement. Your mission is to destroy the enemy mortar position. Your, your mission is to protect the logistics convoy. Your mission is to defend the government buildings. But it wouldn't stop there. We'd also explain why the mission was necessary, why we were asking these guys to do what we were asking them to do. We thought that was crucial. It didn't have to be war and peace. It could just be succinct. But they needed to understand why they were putting their lives on the line. Your mission is to destroy the enemy mortar position in order to ensure the safety of the engineers working on the bridge. Your mission is to protect the logistics convoy in order to enable the resupply of the camp. Your mission is to defend the government buildings to enable the spreading of the rule of law and security for the population. We wouldn't say just what we were doing, we would say why we were doing it, and that was crucial. Now, the second detail I'd like to draw out is that according to this definition, anyone can show leadership. It's not just for the senior management team or the senior leadership team, so-called, who can lead. But the most junior employee, if they are behaving in a way that's driven by their values and beliefs, and that's inspiring others to perform well, then they too are showing leadership. And of course, as the managers, this form of behavior should be encouraged. But what values and what beliefs? It's been mentioned uh, this evening already, but um, in training, we try to instill in our recruits the commando ethos, the commando spirit, and this is caught up in four tenets of it. Courage, determination, selflessness, and cheerfulness in the face of adversity. That's the benchmark that we hold ourselves to. We try to live by it at all times, and we measure ourselves against those values. By showing those values in everything that we do, we express leadership, and people are drawn to that, they're inspired by it, and they raise their performance to boot. Now, just to try and demonstrate some of these values in action, <coughs> this was driven home to me very strongly during a period I spent in Sangin District Center. Some of you may have heard of Sangin. It was, for a time, the most lethal area of Afghanistan with over 25% of all British fatalities happening within the Sangin Valley hotspot. I flew in in 2007 with my company in order to hold the government buildings against an onslaught of Taliban fighters, narco barons, and an array of other warlords. Sangin was and is still the center of the opium trade in Helmand province, and all of these players were keen to wrest it, not just from our control, but from each other's. It was a real mess and we understood very little of this at the time. When we flew in with about 50 men, there was an unofficial ceasefire at the time, which we hoped would last. It did not. And we soon found ourselves surrounded, being attacked every day by mortars, rockets, rocket-propelled grenades, and small arms fire. We were completely cut off by road. The only way in or out was by helicopter. Now, Sometimes people ask how, in the 21st century, the British military could allow itself to get surrounded, outmanned, and outgunned in such a fashion. But I'd remind you that at the time, there were only several hundred combat troops in Helmand province, a landmass the size of Wales, that it was halfway around the world in Central Asia, and that we had misunderstood the nature of the problem. That's a complicated way of saying we really bulls things up. 
Um, <clears throat> our toilets, for some reason, when you're explaining to people what it was like, you always revert to what the facilities was like, were like. You know, Where did you go to the loo? Where did you wash? Our toilets consisted of a wooden outhouse, a row of wooden cubicles with holes through the seats. Now, we'd sanded the seats down to protect you know, from awkward splinters. It was all very comfortable, very pleasant, very private, until the enemy landed a rocket right outside the front doors of these uh, cubicles. Now, fortunately, no one was inside at the time and no one was hurt, but the cubicles were shut up to hell. There were holes through the doors, and that one moment's peace that you had each day, that one moment of privacy, was completely gone. Everyone could see you doing your business. Uh, it was very frustra frustrating. One of the wittier marines had circled one of these holes and written, two inches to the left equals an embarrassing death. We faced sustained attacks at all times of the day and night for three weeks. We were surrounded on all sides by buildings and beyond them by high ground, which was all held by the enemy. The only high ground we possessed was a three-story building in the middle of the base where we positioned our heavy weapons and our fire support team. These were the men who would talk to the air and to the artillery a few miles away, who were dropping bombs on the enemy positions around us as our only effective form of defense. So imagine now that in a town of one-story buildings, there's a British military base. And in the middle of that military base, there's a three-story building. If you were an enemy fighter, what would you be using as your aiming marker? Exactly. That, that building received more incoming than any other in the whole of Afghanistan. It became a very dangerous place to be. And yet, day in, day out, the lads had to traipse up there because we needed to keep our heavy weapons up there to return fire, and we needed our fire control team up there to ping the enemy positions and talk to the guns and talk to the air. So the fire controllers, the fire control team, they had a very specialist role, being able to ping an enemy position a long way away and relay those coordinates to a pilot that's moving at hundreds of miles per hour in the air and get the bomb to drop in the right place from the artillery is a very specialist role. We had a three-man team doing the job, and they were kept very busy. Over the first few days, we sustained a few casualties, nothing too serious, a few shrapnel wounds, um, the walking wounded, as we said, and it uh, wasn't too bad. But then the attacks got heavier and heavier and more frequent. And eventually, the tower took a direct hit from a rocket-propelled grenade, mortally wounding two members of the three-man fire support team. We brought them downstairs and tried to revive them, but unfortunately, their wounds were too severe. Now, I remember it was a three-man team with two men gone. There was just one man left. His name, he was a Lance Bombardier in 2-9 uh, Commando Artillery, and his name was Brummy Jennings is a young man. He was obviously very visibly shaken and upset at having lost two of his comrades. So I decided that, as the troop commander, it's probably my role to have a chat with him. I felt very ill-equipped to do that, but I called him over. I wasn't really sure what I was going to say to him. I was concerned for the man just as an individual, but also because he was now the only person who could fulfill this crucial role of talking to the air and to the guns. He started walking across to me, but before I even started talking, there was a loud explosion. We were under attack again. He simply looked at me, shrugged his shoulders, turned on his heels, and ran straight back up the tower to man his position and carry on doing his job. Now, we were exhausted at this point, and tired and scared and even bored of these attacks. And there were many other easy options we could have taken rather than manning our positions and going through the whole process again many safer options we could have taken. But seeing Brummy Jennings, having gone through what he'd just gone through, turn on his heels and go and do his job, inspired everyone into action. No one had an excuse, and we all followed his example. There were no more casualties that day. I'll stay with uh, Brummy Jennings because he was now down to a one-man team, so we had to fly, fly in a few more people to support him, and they arrived later that night. They were led by a man called Mick Smith, Sergeant Major Mick Smith. He was a Liverpudlian, he was an army boxing champion, and he was hard as nails. He flew in and he helped us to take the fight straight back to the enemy, and we hit them very, very hard. 
Mick was in the middle of every fight. On one occasion, I saw him running past me with a map in one hand, a radio in the other hand, talking to the air, trying to drop a bomb on the bad guys. There was a medic running after him, trying to sew up a shrapnel wound in his buttock that was bleeding profusely. This scouser did not care. Nothing was going to stop him. Unfortunately, he was stopped two days later. He was killed in exactly the same manner as the men whom he'd come in to replace. Bromie Jennings was with him at the time. He helped carry him down off the tower. He held his hand as we tried to revive him, and eventually he carried him onto the helicopter that came to pick him up. At this point, you'd imagine that Brimmy Jennings would have had enough and would have wanted to pack it in. We would have understood. We're, in fact, making contingencies for that very case. But this man was driven by a belief that he needed to do his job well in order to protect the rest of the people around him. He was driven by a belief that we needed to see the job through so that no one had to come in our stead and finish the job off afterwards. He was driven by a belief that if he didn't fight hard, then he wouldn't get home to his wife and his baby girl. He was awarded the Military Cross for Valor, which I think was an apt recognition of his action over those weeks. Our beliefs are a very, very powerful thing. If your actions are driven by them, then you'll inspire the people around you into action, and their performance will improve. So let your people know what your beliefs are. Let them know what drives you, what gets you out of bed in the morning. Let them know what your values are. And I don't mean put it on a website and in a glossy magazine. I mean live them. Demonstrate through your actions what your values and your beliefs are. That's how you lead. That's how you inspire people, and that's how you'll get people to commit themselves to you and give their all. Thank you very much indeed.